Thank you very much indeed, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me, on behalf of uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, to be with you and to share just, uh, just a little of the work that uh, my colleagues undertake. The professor is giving a talk next week on the diseases of the First World War, and amongst them will be conditions like typhoid and cholera, and in fact, their conditions, which our medical colleagues still grapple with in the world. But my task, perhaps, is to say a word about humanitarian medicine and, in particular, surgery in conflict settings. But you see the subtitle, In the Real World. And I say that because having spent 35 years uh, propping up universities and the health service, I, I realise now that there's a vast world out there where the challenges are all a little bit different. Now, many of you might think humanitarian medicine, what a wishy-washy, tree-hugging approach that is. And don't tell me it's another charity asking for help. So I'm going to try and persuade you that it has an important role still in this world, a role that I think Sir Thomas Gresham would have applauded because his donations to charity and the establishment of the Gresham College was part of that philanthropic responsibility as he saw it to his fellow human being. So Médecins Sans Frontières and Doctors Without Borders, just to give you a little hint, is a global organisation working in many parts of the world dealing with many medical problems. You have to show pictures of children, I'm told. I have colleagues here who tell me, if you don't show pictures of children, nobody's interested and they all go home. But this is to remind me, to remind you, that although I will be talking about disaster and conflict, most of our work is with communities in crisis who are then tipped over by the sort of diseases that perhaps you and I have long forgotten. Outbreaks of measles in refugee camps is one of the biggest killers in under five-year-olds. Malnutrition, something which amazingly is rearing its head again in some selected groups, can become a devastating event. There's a thing called the hunger gap in this season for some three or four months where many communities will simply not have enough food to tide them over, and other conditions like malaria and so forth that we no longer see in Europe. So what's Médecins Sans Frontières? It all sounds very French, doesn't it? And we don't do French. Well, it arose originally during the Biafran War. And I won't ask you to put your hand up if you remember the Biafran War, but it's the more, oh, it's the more mature generation. Oh, goodness me, well... It was that dreadful conflict that broke out in Nigeria with the separatist movement in Biafra at the beginning of the 1970s. And a small group of French doctors working with the Red Cross were so appalled by what they were seeing, not just medically, but in terms of humanitarian abuse, that they spoke out something that in general the Red Cross does not do. I'm not being critical, I've worked with the International Committee. But at that time they didn't speak out. And so these young doctors spoke out, complained about the horrific events they were seeing and were promptly uh, thrown out of the organisation. And they said this is really not good enough. And they set up a small group of voluntary uh, medics and nurses and physios to try to respond. And if I'm honest, in the 70s and 80s, that response was relatively modest. But again, now we're into the younger members of the audience. You will remember the two catastrophes that befell the world in humanitarian terms in the mid-90s. Rwanda, Srebrenica, Bosnian Muslims slaughtered. And the tragedy was that this was in the presence, to an extent, of our international community that so many of us as young people had seen as the solution to supporting 
uh, the oppressed of the world. And so MSF scaled up its whole medical activities. If the international community is not going to respond, then we will respond. We will seek young medics from around the globe who are willing to work and we will speak out if necessary to the international community. And so we scaled up in an extraordinary fashion. We now have more than 35,000 medical workers across the globe working with communities in crisis. We're not the World Health Organization. We don't rebuild health structures. We work with communities in crisis in their hour of need. Médecins sans frontières, no borders, no barriers. How naive can that be in this modern world? And there is, of course, a background framework with which we work. More than 100 years ago, following Durand's uh, uh, outrage at finding so many injured on the battlefield more than 24 hours after the conflict in northern Italy and the establishment of the Red Cross, a whole series of conventions largely dealing with the weapons that could be used. I was embarrassed to discover one of the main driving forces to the Second Hague Convention was the use of dum-dum bullets by the British Army. I didn't know that dum-dum was a town in northern India, but it was apparently the place where the British Army allegedly used bullets, the top of which had been filed off so that they had a devastating impact. So there are severe, a series of conventions about the behaviour in warfare and of course after the Second World War with the United Nations, these were drawn together in the Fourth Geneva Convention and then the individual human rights all brought together. All well and good. These principles in large measure related, quite rightly, to non-combatants, to prisoners and to refugees. But the problem is, of the world that we work in, things have changed a little since then, and wars have changed. There are fewer wars between one country and the next. The conflict is often within the country. As I come on my train this morning, and I'm sure you did on the news, we listened to UK, Ukraine and Crimea. And here we have turmoil within a country. And this is important because the definition of refugee is someone who crosses an internationally recognised border. And if you do that and you are destitute, under the United Nations Charter, there is an obligation for support. But now what we find is the number of people displaced within their own country is often a very, very much bigger problem. And many of the conventions don't cover that. So in the real world at this time, we find difficulties of accessing these people, frequently in unstable settings and often insecure. And I say those three things quickly, but it is an immensely challenging thing in practice to deal with. So our focus is on the community in crisis. So what's this? Is this conflict? Is this disaster? And in many ways the two are very similar. But this is Port-au-Prince, not too long after the earthquake on the 12th of January 2011. To the left you don't see, but just off is one of our uh, uh, bases where we had been working with the destitute in Port-au-Prince, and people came or were brought or carried on doors to where they thought there might be help and, and support. And we had to mobilise very quickly indeed to get our teams in, uh, flying into the Dominican Republic and driving through the night so that we could be down there. And this is an example of our ward blocking off the road outside a hospital where we were working. And one of my challenges 
is to help to prepare our young medics to go into situations like this, brought up in big hospitals in Birmingham or Cambridge or London, with X-ray machines, with CT scanners, with intensive care. And they say, what do you mean I won't have X-rays? What do you mean I won't have all the panoply? And yet these people here can benefit immensely from relatively simple medicine. And this first phase, as we call it, is the emergency response that we put onto the ground. We call it under the tree for the very obvious reasons. Uh, this is a fairly senile individual who stands before you now. And my great embarrassment, I can't remember what the tree was, but things kept falling on our heads as it, as it, as it went, uh, went by. But the reason to show this is to show the real heroes in this. Who are these folk here? It is always the national staff. It is always the people from the country who are first responders and the most important. And we go in to support them. And the fact that we turn up suddenly provides a focus for medical people. This is one of our obstetric anesthetists who heard we were back and working and came to help with the, with the victims and those wounded and injured uh, after the earthquake. Hundreds of people, thousands of people damaged under those circumstances. And we move very, very quickly. We put in a general surgeon or general surgical teams for the first uh, week or so. Very difficult to get in. The airport's blocked. Air traffic control is gone. There's no fuel. And as soon as we can, we get our field hospitals in and we bring in what we call the clever doctors. They're the specialists. And you all know what a specialist is. A specialist is someone who turns up weeks later and said, who on earth has done this? <laughs> and so the clever doctors come in to deal with the burns and the orthopedics and the plastics and, and our logisticians start blowing up field hospitals. And then we put inside smart stuff and x-ray machines and, 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 and everything else. But it is an immense logistic challenge sometimes to get into those settings or perhaps Pakistan up with the earthquake or the floods. So MSF responds. And where's this? Philippines. Was it in November? I forget the dates of it, but we heard that a massive typhoon was heading for the Philippines. The Philippines, I'm told, have typhoons every two or three weeks, but this was a massive one. This is Tacloban here, uh, I think 36 hours afterwards, and this is the hospital facility completely flooded with the roof down and destroyed. But the truth is that many of these wounded and, and casualties uh, with simple care, will, will, you can prevent wounds getting infected and, and prevent the problems of overwhelming infection or indeed tetanus that you may be hearing about Next, next week. So it's a rapid response team that we look to. Now, of course, humanitarian medicine and surgery isn't the newest things. In the same time that Sir Thomas was bequeathing the lectures that today I'm, I'm giving, Ambrose Parry was saying famously to doctors, if you want to understand surgery and learn surgery, you must first go to war. And the reason was that the wounds would expose you to areas that you had to deal with that, if I can call civilian practice, would have been unheard of. Who can tell me what this operation is? One of the commonest operations of the day, and sadly one that sometimes is still necessary. Amputation, sir, indeed. One of the very commonest operations, and we're not too far from... Uh, well, it was in St. Thomas's Hospital. I wonder if any of you have been into the old operating theatre there. If you, if you have a rather macabre interest, I, I do encourage you to do so. There was a very famous surgeon, the story goes, I'm sure it's apocryphal, but that because people died of shock very quickly, amputations had to be done very rapidly. And an amputation of the leg in two minutes was not uncommon. But Sir Abathnot Lane was said to be an absolute master and he could do the amputation in under one minute 
sometimes removing the finger of his first assistant and the left testicle of his second. <laughs> so amputation was a common procedure in war. And why? Because infection, if you allowed damaged tissue to remain. And as I say, the great killer in the first war was tetanus or gas gangrene. So Médecins Sans Frontières does respond to casualties in violence. But one of our problems is access. This is a, a picture of the southern part of uh, South Sudan. Because we speak out when we find uh, humanitarian tragedies and abuse, because we challenge the authorities who are responsible for the care of their citizens, then we are not always popular. We always say to the team, somebody does not want you there. Maybe the authorities, or local people. And we have been thrown out, evicted is the term, I think, from northern Sudan, Sri Lanka. I was arrested. And we have the problem of Syria. And perhaps for a few moments I'll say a word about that. But before doing so, what right have we got to go into people's country? What are we doing this morning? Complaining about the UK and Crimea? Crimea. What right does Russia have to go in? What right do we have? Well, this would be my legal fig leaf. If there are lawyers in this audience, I would beg you to be patient. But the UN article in 2005 is called the Universal Responsibility to Protect, R2P. And what that really means is that the British government, French government, Russian government, Ukraine government has a principal responsibility to care and protect its civilians. But this says, if it should fail to do so, then the international community is obliged to use appropriate, peaceful means to do so. So we would interpret that to mean, well, if you're not looking after your cholera victims or your casualties, we will come in under R2P and help you. So what does that mean? Well, here are the sort of pictures that you've seen almost each evening on your televisions over the last three years. This is Syria, I don't know if you can see, but with Damascus down here, with the major towns of Homs and Aleppo on this coastal area. And this is a rather old uh, map. But what it, it, it deigns to show is there were large areas of the country that were no longer under government control. They were under the control, if that's the right word, of op opposition uh, people following the Arab Spring and the response to that. So MSF goes to Damascus, goes to the authorities and say, we would like to come and work in your country with people who are injured, wounded and those internally displaced. And the authorities have yet, after three years, to agree to that. And so we, under R2P, have taken teams in, and you'll understand I'm being a little circumspect, by irregular routes into the areas where the main casualties and the main fighting, main fighting is. Until relatively recently, the teams walked in through the hills to get to some of our projects. And why do we do that? Because we're big, macho, not at all. But because when you see this in the flesh and you see the events, it's very difficult not to wish to respond to that. And I'm going to show a couple of pictures just to try to bring home to you what this means in practice. Here we see Rachel, who's an English anaesthetist working in the West Country, who each year spends four to six weeks with us in one of the projects. She's down in the basement of a house in, uh, in, in the northwest of Syria. And you can see her anaesthetizing a patient will be one of hundreds that our teams will treat with the local Syrian doctors and nurses, the few that remain. She is working in what is suboptimal conditions, to say the least. 
and yet many lives can be saved by that same approach. Um, as a surgeon, I just wasn't so lucky. They put me in a tent in an old apple store cave and people did unpleasant things outside, dropping bombs and so forth. And then the roof started to crumble and then this inflatable operating theatre started to leak and slowly descend. And they do that to people in MSF. But the truth was that we were putting a forward casualty station as close as we could to the casualties because so many of the casualties came from these barrel bombs, as they're called. I don't know if there's somebody in the audience, I think this is an ME-25. It's a helicopter gunship. I gather it costs millions of pounds. And what they are doing is taking oil barrels, filling it with explosive and bits of metal, and pushing it out the door, literally. And you see this barrel coming down, and then there is an explosion and, and, and devastation of the area. And these were hitting the side of the mountain where I was and we had to move and the whole, whole place collapsed about three weeks later. So the challenge for the medics working under those circumstances are, are, are quite immense. Now I mentioned the Philippines. We've had in MSF a very bad three months. The Philippines came on top of Syria. Some of you may have heard of the Central African Republic, which went into meltdown in, uh, in, in November. And then just before Christmas, on the 15th of December, South Sudan exploded in violence and conflict. Sudan was, of course, under the British uh, mandate... Uh, for many years, here is the north, Egypt, Red Sea, Eritrea, Ethiopia. You will, of course, be familiar with the problem that there has been in the western region of Darfur for many years, where the local tribal uh, uh, people were in conflict and where the government in Khartoum uh, uh, were, in, shall I say, were involved. The south became independent after a 25-year war from the north about five years ago and celebrated the newest country on the planet in July 2011. But you can see where I'm heading from the red lines. This isn't the White Nile from Ethiopia, Blue Nile. These are the oil pipes that drain away from the large oil fields near Malakal and Abbey, which are right along the border between the north and the south of Sudan. And the border in these areas are, are, is disputed territory. So the south would say, well, we've got the oil fields, but the only way to get the oil out at the moment is through pipelines that run through the north up to the Red Sea port you won't be surprised to hear they're building a pipeline elsewhere. Well, not surprisingly, tensions built up and then tensions within the fractions of South Sudan came to a head in the autumn. The politicians who'd fought together against the North, once that threat had gone, started to break up politically. And on the 15th of December, the presidential guard turned on, its, on itself and uh, some 70 or 80 men were killed because the presidential guard was made up of two fractions, the Dinka tribe and the Nuer tribe, reflecting the ethnic origin of the president and the vice president. And there followed a bloody, dramatic conflict within, within days. We've had teams in there for uh, many years. This is a country that has been dis devastated by the fighting, which has virtually no infrastructure. But when I got into there, people were fleeing the fighting. The United Nations were uh, trying to move people out, to, um, Ethiopians and so forth. The airport were, were blocked. And so we took in 
we took in our emergency teams. Um, it, it's, it's always, of course, well, what's happening, how many casualties, uh, what have you done? But the truth is the misery that goes on for many of this population in crisis is the every day today we're getting water, getting food, fleeing the fighting will lead to great distress. But I went into a place called Lankian, which is in the middle of the newer area, to a hospital where we've been treating a, a disease called Calorazar, an epidemic that runs every few years, and set up a forward casualty centre and uh, within a week or two we treated hundreds of casualties. And I show this, uh, not to blow our own trumpets, that there is virtually nobody else in this country, virtually nobody else. But just to show the sort of numbers within, within a short period of time, I, I'm not quite sure. I think this was in the first seven or eight weeks after the fighting broke out. And you'll see the amount of surgery and uh, 750 major operations. But, but look at this. The population doesn't suddenly become healthy. Women don't suddenly stop having babies. And of course they're displaced. They're away from their bases and we'll get into immense difficulties if we're not very careful. So what's the challenge? Well, the challenge is for our young medics to cope with the large numbers and very basic circumstances under the tree. This is one of our hospitals in a place called Lear, up towards the north where I'd worked for a few days to stabilise things. That's my operating theatre when we got back to it about three weeks later. Because one or other fraction will see us as aiding the enemy, aiding the opposition, and therefore a perfectly legitimate target. But this is the only health facility for miles and miles around. And some of our staff, some of our national staff who live in the air, the, the town is empty now, have gone to the bush and have taken with them the patients that they were caring for in the hospital with TB and with other wounds. And this is the remains of the Tuchel that I was in for those days. So a grim situation, and perhaps with an audience more of my age than youngsters, will say, what a hopeless situation. Isn't it time you just all went home, let them sort it all out? How can you work medically if your facilities are going to get destroyed? And Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, works with young medics who come in and they're not going to tolerate that. This is not good enough. We're going to change this world, Paul McMaster, that your generation have left like this. And there are the numbers of patients admitted in one uh, country just a little while ago. Young medics will not accept that nothing can be done. There is more that we can do. And it is that anger and determination of our volunteers that I think drives us and drives us on. We are impartial, we are neutral, we are secular. We're on nobody's side except the side of the patient who is wounded or injured, who needs urgent medical care. We will not accept funds from governments, the UN, the European Union, in any area where there's conflict. We will perhaps for vaccination in Congo or something like that. And we survive on the energy and the anger of our young medics that this can go on and the support of hundreds and thousands of people who give a very small do donation on a regular basis. So for me, at the end of my career, and I was just saying as a young doctor, it was my hope that I would work in the developing world. I was put off by the first chapter in the book on tropical medicine. I don't know if we've got doctors in the audience, but the first chapter was on worms. And I got to the end of that and I thought, I, I can't spend my professional life doing that. But having done my academic stuff and run mega departments, for me it's a great privilege to support an organisation like this. And we're not just interested in saving lives, although that's very often obvious, but we're interested where we can in relieving suffering and restoring independence. 
this picture for me is a very difficult one. I've got grandchildren now. Uh, one of my granddaughters is the age of this child. And this is a child whose left leg I had to amputate under local anaesthetic in Haiti when we'd run out of everything. Family have no idea uh, where they are. They may have been lost in the earthquake. And our task is not just to save her life, but to relieve suffering and try and restore independence. And so our work will be followed by the physios and rehabilitation and mental health as we can. And the promise we give to youngsters like this is, you will dance again, or we will die (laughs) making that happen. And I say to you, I know this isn't the real world that I'm talking about. It's raining in London. You've got nice talks tomorrow on the European Union and the legal. But for many, many millions across this globe, this is the real world. And for me, it's a great privilege to support an organisation that will take its volunteers into these critical places to help. Thank you very much indeed for listening to me today. Thank you. (laughs) 